Last time, we looked at how Ukiyote was formed by former Capcom designer Kenshi Naruse, and built on his experience by creating two games that were overlooked by gamers at the time, Hook and Skyblazer. Todd McFarlane's Spawn was a breakout hit in the 1990s. A creation of the grim and gritty era of 1990s comics, it won fans by spinning a bleak Faustian take on superheroes and avoiding the embarrassments of its contemporaries. Such popularity demanded a video game, and Spawn got one on the Super NES in 1995 thanks to Ukiyote. On its surface, it's a thorough recreation of the Spawn mythos taking its hero from the mundanely squalid New York alleys to showdowns with the legions of hell itself. Beneath the surface, though, Ukiyote's motifs appear, along with a Skyblazer-like soundtrack courtesy of Fujita. Spawn has a languid jump and varied attacks reminiscent of both Skyblazer and Hook. He's able to wall jump just as Sky was. He also gains some special moves, straight out of Capcom's Street Fighter 2. In terms of pure detail, Spawn might be Ukiyote's most impressive work. The sprites are nicely animated, and the backgrounds are memorably gruesome. In contrast to the much cruder and cartoonish artwork of the cutscenes, the levels throw occasional novelty your way, including a stage all about dodging gunfire and an underworld boss that's a gigantic, multi-screen monstrosity, seemingly inspired by the battleship stage of our type. Spawn stumbles more than Ukiyote's previous efforts, though. Its hero takes up a lot of screen space, and his attacks seem delayed. It's far too easy to take damage, and far too tempting to use Spawn's Delsum-esque dive kick over and over. Spawn the video game had unfortunate timing, arriving in a massively crowded marketplace of 1995. The PlayStation and Saturn were stealing space from 16-bit systems like the Super NES, and publishers would soon jump to this new generation. Ukiyote and Acclaim were also a little ahead of the Spawn wave. McFarlane Toys had only started up the previous year, and both the Spawn movie and Violent HBO animated series hadn't arrived. At least Ukiyote could take solace in their Spawn game being decent for a superhero-derived title, and a masterpiece compared to the Spawn game that followed it. If the game industry was through with the Super NES, Ukiyote wasn't. Their last big original creation was the last thing you'd expect from the makers of the Ornate Skyblazer and Grizzly Spawn. Punky Skunk's origins apparently lie in Magical Kid Gooman, a kid-friendly Super Famicom platformer with a shape-shifting hero. Previews appeared in Japanese magazines in 1994, but the game never arrived. Ukiyote switched publishers to a new company called Visit and, according to an interview with Naruse, refashioned the game into something with international appeal. A skunk. Cooley Skunk found its jumpsuited hero fending off evil wolves and mice with his... scent attack? But he also pogo jumps, paraglides, and rides a jetpack. And so he joins Peter Pan, Sky, and Spawn among Ukiyote's lineup of flying heroes. Cooley Skunk was initially bound for the Super Famicom, and perhaps the Super NES, as a European or American release was clearly planned. However, the game never arrived beyond a demo for Nintendo's Japan-exclusive Satellaview service. The market had shifted away from 16-bit systems. But Ukiyote didn't want to abandon all their work. Cooley Skunk became a PlayStation game, 
and in the process, it expanded its levels and gained some sharper graphics. At a glance, however, it still looked like a Super NES game. To make matters worse, the game didn't even come to America until over a year after its Japanese launch. A lot of impressive 2D PlayStation games stayed in Japan. But for some reason, Coolie Skunk was an exception. Jalico renamed it Punky Skunk and slapped it with the tagline, One Wicked Weasel. This was a misnomer. While the skunk was traditionally grouped under the family Mastilidae, commonly called the weasel family, recent studies have reclassified the skunk under their own family of Mephididae. Otters, ferrets, badgers, pine martens, minks, and wolverines technically fall under the weasel family. The skunks and stink badgers remain distinctly separate. I've got it! As 16-bit platformers go, Punky Skunk is hardly terrible. Average, perhaps, but no worse than the dozens of other animal mascot games that clog the Super NES and Sega Genesis libraries. It's cute, it's competent, and it's only mildly obnoxious in its attempt at a mascot with attitude. But it was the last thing anybody wanted on the PlayStation in North America. Critics savaged Punky Skunk as a clueless throwback. And it even became a minor laughing stock as a failed attempt at a video game mascot. Awesome Possum and Wild Woody may be worse characters and worse games but no one tried to sell them to the PlayStation crowd of 1998. Interestingly enough, the original 16-bit Punky Skunk wasn't lost forever. A Satellaview cartridge with the Punky Skunk demo was purchased at a Super Potato location in Japan and later released online in early 2020. And enterprising hackers found that it contained the entire game. In 1998, however, Punky Skunk was the end of Ukiyote's pantheon of side-scrollers about high-flying heroes. They'd gone from blockbuster films and comic book superstars to, well, this guy. Ukiyote continued on, however. They developed the Shinri series, a line of psychological quiz games on the Super Famicom, and the line continued on the PlayStation. That was also where Ukiyote found an ally in Capcom's greatest rival. SNK had stuck with their Neo Geo arcade hardware all through the 1990s, and the PlayStation and Saturn presented new opportunities to port Neo Geo titles. For their first SNK work, Ukiyote had the rotten luck to attempt a PlayStation version of Samurai Showdown 3 cramming a beautifully animated fighting game into the PlayStation's limited memory. The results were an awkward, sluggish mess. But Ukiyote fared better with their PlayStation versions of The King of Fighters 97 and Metal Slug. SNK had plans beyond the Neo Geo, and in the late 1990s, they debuted the Neo Geo Pocket and the Pocket Color. Many popular SNK series were reimagined as handheld games, and SNK trusted Ukiyote with the Metal Slug name. Metal Slug First Mission and Second Mission are remarkable in translating the action of a gorgeously animated side-scrolling game to a system not much more powerful than the Game Boy Color. The graphics show a lot of personality, and they even worked in some sky-based levels, including one that lets you ride gusts of wind, just like in Skyblazer and Punky Skunk. Once again, Ukiyote liked to let players fly. Ukiyote also crafted a Neo Geo Pocket oddity called Shigeru Mizuki's Yokai Photo Album. Co-created by the author of the popular Gay 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 no Kitaro, it sends players through an action RPG quest to capture yokai on film, like a spookier Pokemon Snap. Sadly, this would be the last time Ukiyote got to make a remotely original game. The Neo Geo Pocket capitulated in 2000, unjustly doomed by SNK's merger with Pachinko Magni Aruze. Ukiyote went to work on ports again, 
assisting with King of Fighters titles on the PlayStation 2, including a remake of the King of Fighters 94. So when exactly did Ukiyote collapse? The company's website remains up, but the last title mentioned is Metal Slug Second Mission, and the last documented sign of the developer was in Kirby Mass Attack in 2011. While many Japanese developers of decades past survived behind the scenes, all reports point to Ukiyote's demise at some point in the last decade. Ukiyote never attained the clout of some former Capcom developers. Yet, they had a unique vision of the side-scrolling platformer. One that paced things slightly slower and gave players more aerial freedom than most. That may not make Ukiyote an unsung paragon of game design, but it's easy to look at Skyblazer and the pocket-sized metal slugs and see a developer that never got the chance they really deserved. Any fan of Capcom or side-scrollers in general would do well to try out Ukiyote's creations. Ukiyote's name itself embodies the developer's style, as well as their fate. Ukiyo roughly translates to floating world, and is best known in the West for Ukiyo-e, the art of woodblock prints popularized in the 18th and 19th centuries. It's strangely fitting for Ukiyote and their penchant for floating play mechanics. However, Ukiyo also has a philosophical interpretation. It refers to a temporary state of existence and to the art of embracing that fleeting moment to its fullest. There's no question that Ukiyote lived up to both meanings with their short but striking career. So, take a bow, punky skunk. You might not entirely deserve it, but Ukiyote did. So that's the story of Ukiyote. Thanks for joining us and highlighting an unsung game creator. Uh, we had a really great time making this, and I hope it didn't sound like we were too hard on Punky Skunk. Uh, so anyways, if you'd like to see more from us, you can help by liking and subscribing, of course, and consider backing us on Ko-Fi. The URL's in the description. A special thank you to our first backer on Ko-Fi, Casey Hebner. If you learned anything or have any great memories of some of these games, please feel free to share them in the comments. We will see you next time.